Let's think about something for a second. Now it says there in the text, the master gives more to those who have and takes away from those who have little. Does that sound like the God we celebrate in all these other texts? Does that sound and jive with what we read in our call to worship based on Luke 1, when Mary hears the good news that she is going to give birth to a son and she sings this song we call the Magnificat. The rich will be sent away empty. The poor will be filled with good things. Does that seem to jive with each other? Hold that in your heads just a little bit. Now, you may not believe this, and it's okay if you don't, but when I was a kid, I could be a bit of a smart aleck. <laughs> You're not supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> I see you pointing. Now, I wasn't a real big fan of writing as a child. I didn't like all these punctuation things, and I probably because I had bad handwriting. My teacher would give me bad grades for bad handwriting and grammar, and, and I would probably just want to write more than my hand could keep up with. I had more I wanted to say than I could keep up with, so I didn't want to stop and pause for things like commas and colons and periods and paragraph markers. But my teacher liked to point out all those mistakes with those evil red pens they use sometimes. But one day in Sunday school with Mr. Welch, I learned something very interesting. The Bible didn't have any punctuation when it was originally written. No paragraphs, no chapter and verse numbers, no little helpful headings that say the parable of the talents. Everything ran together. Now I found that very interesting. Not necessarily for what it did for my understanding of the Bible and how to interpret it, but as it went with my own writing. So next time my teacher marked off some red things, he said, Mrs. Wilson, you know, the Bible didn't have punctuation and paragraphs, and people seem to love this book. If it's good enough for God, she cut me off right there. <laughs> But what my Sunday school teacher told me always kind of stuck with me. That didn't have these punctuation marks. We added it all. So what if we got it wrong? The parable of the talents that you just heard seems pretty straightforward. A master has three slaves and gives each of them these talents, five, two, and one, according to their abilities. The master goes off, comes back, and has an accounting. He tells the first two servants that doubled his money, well done, enter into the joy of your master in a golden parachute, 403, 401k, all these things. And then he has a bit of a confrontation with the last servant that sees this servant thrown into the outer darkness where there is much weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew loves the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what do we do with this parable? What's the question this parable is calling us to answer or ponder? Here's a question. How are you using your talents? Have you ever heard this question raised about this parable? See, what comes next is you get a survey, and you answer all these questions like, do you play a musical instrument? Do you like to sing? Do you like to work with children? Really? You like to work with children? Well, that's great. Here's the first grade Sunday school class. <laughs> and you get a report back that tells you what your spiritual gifts are. Teaching, hospitality, administration, praise, whatever. And they try to line up the talents with the ministries of the church. That's the question a lot of preachers and churches like to ask about this parable. They preach this before you get this survey. But of course, the scholars come along with a question of their own. What are you going to do with the footnote? And the footnote in many of your Bibles at home says something like, Now a talent is a form of money equivalent to 15 years wages for a common laborer. This isn't about your talents for greeting people at the door, folding bulletins, or teaching a Sunday school. It's about money. Now it's kind of unfortunate that the Greek word talent has a, was really a unit of money that we've often lost in translation. It's a parable about money. And I don't know about you, but I cringe a little when I think about the church's history of preaching and teaching on money. 
Even the same preachers, well, they get a little nervous this time of year. I have many friends who say preaching on stewardship is their least favorite thing to do. They avoid all the scriptures that talk about money. And there's over 2,000 of them, so it gets to be a bit of a challenge. So avoidance is one strategy. What I call crazy is another. Perhaps you know the history of the sale of indulgences. If you just give a certain amount of money, you can have your sins wiped off your record so you won't have to spend as much time in purgatory. We're like you get burned off and get purified. Now, I don't have to deal with that because I don't have to spend any time in purgatory at all. I found this out a couple years ago. Apparently, if you go to the Isle of Iona on Columbus Saint Day, you get free pass out of purgatory. I took a picture just in case I needed it as proof later on. Now, I don't necessarily think there's a purgatory, but you like to hedge your bets a bit. But this was actually an effective capital raising strategy. How else do you think they afford those grand cathedrals in Europe? Those cost money. Give her a little more money, get a few sins wiped off your record. We do need an HVAC system, I'm just saying. <laughs> but it still happens today. Sometimes I like to punish myself when I turn on certain Christian radio stations or TV stations. It's almost like a car wreck. You know you should just drive by, but you can't help but slow down and look, or in this case, listen. I was listening the other day, and I heard about a special opportunity. For a gift of $1,000 given to a certain televangelist, he would have your name stenciled on the side of his jet. That way, wherever he went to take the gospel, you'd go with him. Well, your name, you don't get a ride on the jet. You just can't help but cringe when you think about what's been said of the history of interpretation of this parable about money. And so I find it odd that this parable is one of the most common parables preached at stewardship time. Because here we have a demanding master who will throw you into the outer darkness if you can't give the master more, more, more. You know, last week you might have thought the threat of beating or shaking the olive tree for the fruit was bad. This week, the threat of not poning up is eternal torment. So, you know, it seems a little worse. I mean, I guess I see the temptation for preachers in a budget crunch, but this seems more like a parable better suited for the wolf of Wall Street than the Lamb of God. The question always seems to be, how much can you give? Or how much does God expect you to give so you don't get thrown into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth? But I have a question of my own. What are we to do with a master who takes from those who have not and gives to those who have? I mean, it sounds like, well, if you have a lot, God's going to give you more. It sounds like all those prosperity gospel preachers that say, if you have a lot... That's because God loves you and you've done everything right. But if you're struggling, maybe you should pray more. Maybe you haven't done things right. If God really loved you, God would double, triple your money. You can read books. You can go to TV and watch Joel Osteen with his big bright smile and talk about God wants to give you abundance, friends. God wants to have you have a swimming pool. All you got to do is believe. This parable might seem to back that up. Because the more you have, the more God's going to give you. But for those who have little, God's going to even take that away. I mean, isn't that the exact opposite kind of God than the God Mary sings about when she hears she's going to give birth to God's own son and she says, you have sent the rich away empty. You have filled the poor with good things. I mean, what kind of parable is this? What kind of God would that be? That's a lot of questions about one parable. But let me ask just one more that sums it all up. What if we've had it upside down? I don't know if you're familiar with an archaeological find called the Nora Stone. It was found in 1773 in Sardinia. One of the oldest examples of writing ever found, dating back to over 800 years before Christ. Scholars went for years trying to decipher what this stone says. What does it mean? Finally, one of them solved the riddle. Before leaving the museum where it was kept, he left a note to the curator and said, I don't mean to offend, but you have it upside down. 
all these scholars have been looking at it, but it had been in the case upside down. What if we've had this parable upside down? In other words, what makes us think the master is a God figure? Does it ever say? I mean, it might seem like it would be. In many parables, the master is kind of a God figure, but not in all of them. And it's not just the third slave who describes him as harsh. He does not deny it. In fact, he seems to live it out pretty well. I reap where I don't sow. And not just in that. But in the ancient world, they understood the notion of a limited good society. They knew the only way that someone got ahead in the village was at someone else's expense. They knew the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. They got that. They knew it. Now, if you try to tell someone that today, they look at you kind of strange and just say, well, as everybody pulls themselves up by their bootstraps, there's plenty enough. It doesn't always work that way. You try to sell someone, if they use too much water, there won't be enough for someone else. They say, we have plenty of water. Well, yeah, you do. The Colorado River becomes nothing but a trickle before it gets into Mexico because everyone's fighting over the water. If Las Vegas uses all they wanted, California would go dry. There's only so much water. It's one of the biggest sticking points in Middle East peace talks. Who controls the limited water of the Jordan River? And there's another interesting thing. In parables, as sometimes in jokes, there's the principle of three. Like the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan who passed by a wounded traveler on the side of the road. Who's the hero of that story? The Samaritan, the third one. What if the third slave is actually the hero of this story? What if the master is just that, a harsh master who expects a prophet, who expects to reap where he does not sow and gather where he does not plant, who just wants more, 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 no matter what it costs anyone else? And what if the third slave says, I'm not going along with this system anymore? I don't know where you learned economics. My first course was when my parents put a dollar in my palm on Saturdays and said, now don't spend it all at once. Save it. Save it. That's good advice. You don't just want to spend all your money. You need to save. But that can easily get distorted into, I have to make more and keep more. Make more and keep more. And the messages of society say, save, make, save, make, do all you can. Save your pennies, make your fortune and keep it. Is that the message of the gospel? The same gospel that says if someone asks for your cloak, mm, give your shirt too. The same gospel that makes provisions for the poor and the widows. The same gospel that says blessed are the poor. The same gospel that says I've come to preach good news to the poor. You know who the first to get stepped on in a system that promotes save, make, save, make, do all you can? It's the poor. They often can't save because they can barely make enough to provide food, shelter, and clothing to their families. What if there's another way to read this parable? And I think Matthew hints that this is a possibility in the very next passage. Remember, they didn't separate into chapter and verse. They didn't separate into nice little headings. Parable of the talents, parable of the sheep and goats, etc., We're supposed to just keep on reading. Now the next verse says, Now when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered around him, and he will separate people one from the other, as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. Now you know that. It's the parable of how God judges and decides our eternal fate based on how we treat the least of these. When I was a stranger, did you or did you not welcome me? When I was hungry, did you or did you not give me food? When I was thirsty, did you did, or did you not give me drink? When I was sick or in prison, did you visit me or not? And what you did to the least of these, you do to me. Basically, the entire question of salvation, of eternal life, outer darkness again for Matthew, or heaven, is based completely on how you treated the least of these. We'll talk about that more next week, but here's an unfortunate thing. The English translations translate that first word of this 
parable as now. But really, it's kind of more of a contradiction. It's more of a but. It really should be translated but. In other words, the way of the judgment in the world is how much money you make for the master. And if you don't make enough, you're out in the outer darkness. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, it's going to be judged based on how you treat the least of these. The two parables can be set up in juxtaposition. Here's the way the world works. Here's the way God works. And there's a big difference. But often we only read one. And we think, if I just read this one by itself, I get everything I need to learn out of it. We're supposed to read them together. And there's a but there. Now before long, it'll be the Christmas season. And I guess it already is, because the lights are already up. My daughter, Vanity, loves to see the Christmas tree in the sky, as she calls it, over the Hershey Tower. We looked at it last night. There already are TV shows coming on. I have a rule, though. Nothing until after Thanksgiving. You have to have your boundaries. So I'm already DVRing all the good Hallmark Channel movies that are coming on, the cheesy Christmas ones. There's one about a figure skater I'm excited to watch soon. But I don't watch them until after Thanksgiving. Now after Thanksgiving, we'll have more and more shows coming out. And Christmas Story, It's a Wonderful Life, Christmas in Connecticut, and of course, A Christmas Carol. Now, my favorite version of A Christmas Carol is the correct one that everyone should always watch. It's the Muppets version. <laughs> you laugh, but it's actually more true to the text than a lot of the other ones. Now, Ebenezer Scrooge grows up learning the harsh lesson from the masters of the world to make his fortune and keep it. His dad was thrown in debtor's prison, and so he knows about the harsh ma master. He knows him so well, he becomes him. Money is everything, making it and saving it. People become nothing, especially the least of these. People like his clerk, Bob Cratchit. The people who are desperate enough to borrow money from him so he can double his own. That he freely and casually evicts or says, well, aren't there workhouses? Go there. And someone says, well, they would rather die than go there. Well, all the better to decrease the surplus population, he says. According to today's parable traditionally read, Ebenezer Scrooge's practice of making money with money would qualify him to enter into the joy of the master. But Ebenezer's name means God has helped. That's what Ebenezer means. So when we sing, come now fount, here I raise my Ebenezer, it means here I raise a stone that means God has helped. It's from a story in 1 Samuel where the prophet Samuel raises up a stone calling it Ebenezer, meaning thus far God has helped. You're probably familiar with this story. It's the current way Scrooge is acting and the ghost of Christmas yet to come shows him. Shows him on its own stone, his name, that makes him weep and gnash his teeth in that outer darkness of the graveyard of the future. Three spirits, the ghost of Christmas past, present and yet to come. They show him a different way to live not just about making money and keeping it, but a different way to enter into the joy of the master. Scrooge changes. He begins to see the least of these and does something for them. His money is no longer his master, but a tool for helping others, like Tiny Tim. A Christmas carol is kind of like this parable and the parable of the sheep and goats combined into one full story, the way we're supposed to read it. Here's Scrooge how he was in stave one. Here's what he becomes by the end. He lives out the joy of Christmas by helping others. We often start in the first parable like Scrooge, but by God's grace, we learn a different way, counterintuitive as it may be. We're all Ebenezer. God has helped. For we aren't judged by what we can do for the harsh master. We are judged for what we do to help one another. And it's in that that we often receive the help of God through one another, the body of Christ. In the words of Teresa of Avila from the 16th century, Christ has no body now on earth but yours. No hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which the compassion of Christ looks out on a hurting world. 
Yours are the feet, which he is to go about doing good. Yours are the hands, with which he is to bless now. So go and bless. Enter into the joy of the real master, the God who so loved the world that God sent his only son, the God who has a special care for the poor and the needy and the hurt. When you bless others, you bless God. And that's where joy is found, and receiving blessings and passing those on. Not by receiving blessings and making more blessings, just to keep and recycle. There's a but there. When the Son of Man comes, how do you treat the least of these? How do you bless with what you have? So go and bless. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we thank you that you are a God who is with us and for us, a God who sometimes flips things, flips things the way they need to be flipped, a God who flips things so they're right, that it isn't all about what you can get and keep and make, but how we can help one another, how we live as a family, brother and sister, with all the world how we care for the least of these. For as you said, you have come to preach good news to the poor, release to the captive, sight to the blind, liberation for the oppressed. You bless and change the world. Lord, help us to do the same. For we know you are a God who helps. Help us to bless with all that we have been blessed with. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen.